Hello and good evening. I'm Melissa Idris. And I'm Sharad Kutin. You're watching Consider This, the show where we want you to consider and then reconsider what you know of the news of the day. We begin the show tonight with the announcement made earlier by Senior Minister Ismail Sabri Yaakob that the government has decided to no longer allow those entering the country to self-quarantine at home. Now, as of this Friday, the 24th of July, those citizens, those citizens and non-citizens entering Malaysia will be immediately sent to government-designated quarantine centres for mandatory two weeks current quarantine. They'll also have to bear the full cost of quarantine services. Now, Shira, how much do you reckon that this decision to reimpose mandatory quarantine was driven by that viral photo of the woman who was wearing that wristband for home quarantine, but she was seen out at a restaurant? I believe this was in Pera. Did you see the photo? Well, I did see the, the photo, Melissa, and, you know, I want is concerned, I mean, that in, any public policy is driven by, uh, by an image that's gone viral. I, it might just be coincidence. Uh, the question is on what basis a uh, decision like this is made, because mm. it, it has serious implications for the centres. We're going to go back to using hotels. Hotels have already chimed in about the consequences for their businesses uh, in light of the fact that now, uh, you know, with the free movement across state lines, uh, they, they have, in fact, paying customers. Mm. Uh, well, I mean, non-COVID paying customers, that, was, <laughs> that is. Uh, but, you know, we see this, uh, this issue, Melissa, mm. around the world. I mean, whole quarantine uh, depends on a level of uh, discipline and, compl and the compliance based on perhaps uh, understanding of public health issues and uh, a, a clear desire to be helpful to the community. Yeah. That's so, not always present. So, uh, um, at the press conference uh, with uh, DG Hisham earlier today, he talked about um, why home quarantine didn't work. It was because of the non-compliance. And I really, I really do wonder just how many people have not complied because with those um, who undergo mandatory home quarantine, they have to remain at home for 14 days and then they have to take a second COVID-19 test on the 13th day. Now, uh, apparently, authorities have highlighted multiple times the challenges in getting returnees to undergo that second test. A lot of people just don't take it. Um, and I also wonder, you know, with that viral, I know you said perhaps your policy is not designed based on things that go viral well, on social media. Be, yeah. It should yeah, not it be, be designed. But, you know, whether there was kind of community feedback or compliance with that, how many people saw that risk tag and, um, and told that woman off for, for being out in public when she was supposed to be home quarantined. How many people even knew that that risk tag meant she was meant to be at home? Yeah, you know, this, it's very interesting because when we had that discussion a couple of weeks ago with uh, an expert on the Vietnamese situation, social pressures mm. were actually uh, brought to bear on individuals. I mean, perhaps it, in some cases unnecessarily harsh social pressures, but it was a very important factor in Vietnam's ability to contain the crisis. And of course, they took action very quickly. Right. But coming back to you know something that the uh, Malaysian Health Coalition put out about targeted uh, programs, and so that you know at this stage in the game, that any measure taken by government should be very precise. I mean, mm. it should have the quality of a certain surgical uh, precision rather than a, a kind of broad-based, you know, uh, kind of uh, bl blunderbuster uh, <laughs> approach to, um, to, the, to the crisis. Right. Uh, so more of a targeted, um, you know, uh, approach, as you said. I do also want to touch on the cost. So if this is going to happen uh, starting Friday, you know, that uh, returnees, uh, so Malaysia, people coming into Malaysia will have to bear the full cost of a 14-day quarantine at a designated centre. It could be a hotel or, or another type of centre, how much that could cost and whether they would be able to afford it. And that is another consideration, right? The, the cost Absolutely, of that. Absolutely, the cost. And, and like yeah. I said, you know, the, the hoteliers are asking what happens even though they are, right. you know, inclined to, you know, do their national service well, as they were. because once a hotel is, a hotel needs to be gazetted to right. become a quarantine centre. And once it's gazetted, they can't open it up to other guests. So, um, and depending on how many returnees or how many people who come into Malaysia and, and need quarantine, it's likely not to be full at any point in time. Yeah, that, that's the thing, right? So we don't know exactly what the numbers are. I mean, mm. we have broad, uh, broadly an understanding of numbers of Malaysians outside of Malaysia. Whether all of them want to return to, you know, to the homeland, as it were, uh, is a different matter. And so, yes, this is going to have to be calibrated 
uh, quite precisely because, of course, you know, there's not just the peninsula, there's also Sabah and Sarawak Correct. and then uh, and all those adjustments that need to be made. Yeah. OK, we're going to take a quick break in just a few minutes. We're going to take a closer look at Labuan and its development as a federal territory. Stay tuned to consider this. watching Consider This. I'm Melissa Idris. With me is Sharad Kutun. Let's turn our attention now to Labuan, which was handed over by Sabah to the federal government in 1984 to become one of the three feder federal territories of Malaysia. Yesterday in Parliament, Datuk Rosman Isli, the Warisan MP for Labuan, called for Labuan to be returned to Sabah if the federal government cannot commit to developing its economy. Dr. Osman joins us on the show now. Thank you so much for uh, your time tonight. Now, could I ask you what prompted you to make that statement in Parliament yesterday? Okay, let me uh, make a, a bit of correction. In fact, there was no direct uh, statement from me saying that that um, um, the federal government should return it to Sabah if they fail to. Uh, do all the expectations. Right. In fact, that um, that was that was out when uh, Kimani's MP was asking me question. Mm -hmm. Basically, I was just explaining and telling the the one that the federal government has failed and why they failed. So I elaborate, and then there was a question from Kimani's. But of course, I told them that you know if the federal government is not ready to um, to develop Labuan as they are supposed to do, then you know the it is, it is obvious that they should return it to Sabah. And uh, yeah, Rosman, I, mean, Rosman I, I, I understand what you're saying. And the, the, in fact, some of the things that were reported about the problems in Labuan, especially the water crisis issue, yeah, yeah. that was, I think shocked perhaps many people who, you know, when we talk about Labuan, there's a lot of talk about, you know, offshore finance no, and so on and so that's forth. Right. That's, what, that's what I elaborate. You know, yeah. Labuan is supposed to be uh, an international island financial offshore center of Malaysia, well engaged hub for uh, logistics for the upstream. And also uh, Labuan is uh, a wilayah for you know. All right. So all the basics shouldn't be a problem anymore. Right. If, if, Sabah, if Sabah is not expecting to get all this benefit, why would they hand over in 1984? Basically, Labuan was are growing fast uh, in in the first uh, 10 years like that 15 years because we had a uh, top leadership of the country the prime minister who were uh, into it so basically we need we need a commitment from top leadership and after that the right. momentum starts to Okay, can I can I ask you to clarify? Because you also mentioned that almost eighty percent, uh, eighty-five percent of the people in Labuan have lost their water supply. Can you elaborate about this water yeah. crisis? It seems completely unfeasible that this would happen in twenty twenty. Right? Yeah, and that happened. That happened last week, you know. And that was not the first time. It happened every a few years during my my term. I've been MP for seven years, and we experienced three major uh, water disruptions. The small disruption happened all year long. Almost every day there was rupture and uh, leaking all over the place. Is it, because, so think, is it because the infrastructure is old and needs to be replaced? Very old, more than 30 years, it needs to be replaced. So we need budget for it. Labuan Island is a small island. And it is the only federal territory in Malaysian Borneo. So we expect, we expect the federal government to give enough budget to take care of Labuan. 
Rosman, not to I... talk about other, not to talk about other problems. You know, like like our uh, facilities, sport facilities, and all that. The maintenance has been so poorly done, and and many of it are, you know, out of order, unusable. Rosman, can I ask you about your constituents and the people of Labuan? I hear, I understand, you know, Labuan has a population yeah. of perhaps yeah. about 100,000. Well, what well, what is their feeling? Well, what's the they feeling on the ground? They are very frustrated, and all I did was to voice to voice it out. That's my job. Okay. Hello. Yes, yeah. where we're here. Um, have have there been any benefits of Labuan being a federal territory in the past few decades? Oh yeah, they made Labuan a financial center. They built the uh, the financial park, but basically, uh, they, Labuan become. A, uh, an authority, they register the, the international companies in Labuan, offshore companies, but they, are, they were allowed to operate in Kuala Lumpur. And uh, we were hoping that was temporary, but it has been 36 years. And, and we have been demanding that there should be a uh, substance requirement for all these companies. They should uh, have their offices open in Labuan. And that requirement, the substance requirement was passed by parliament uh, two years ago. They were given one year grace period and it is supposed to be enforced this year. Rosman, now, what, what is the consequence? Could you explain to us the consequence of these companies registered in Labuan but not located in Labuan in terms of the, uh, the multiplier effect for the, yeah, the uh, economy? The, the, the economic spin-off is not it's not a greatly sell in Labuan. And in fact, uh, Labuan recorded the second highest only behind Kuala Lumpur in terms of income per capita. But basically this is because of the effect of all those uh, executives who have been working for Labuan company, but basically they live in KL. Okay. Well, I understand, and, I understand that there have always been kind of grand plans for Labuan. You know, there was the Labuan Development Blueprint 2030. We need that. that's, that's what we need. We, we need a grand plan and a grand plan of Labuan won't work unless it is become part of the region. That's why Labuan needs to be closely working with Sabah. And that what prevents it, Rosman? What, pre Sabah. Rosman? What prevents Sabah from, uh, sorry, Labuan from working more closely with Sabah and integrating its plans? Well, uh, what I can, I've, I've been uh, chairman of Labuan Corporation for five years until uh, two zero one eight. Then I know, I know that Labuan, in fact, has been put into a very disadvantaged position. Not here, neither there. That is what people have been saying. Uh, because, you know, um, we were basically uh, administered under the Federal Territory Ministry. Now, last time it was under uh, Prime Minister Department. And then uh, Sabah has their own program. And a lot of our major industries, oil and gas and all that, Basically, the oil and gas are Sabah gas, are Sabah oil. Mm. And once Salabuan is no longer controlled by Sabah, and now the new leaders is taking over the leadership of Sabah, so basically, you know, they, they want to develop their area. Well, thank so you so much. In, in, the same thing, in the same thing for the federal government. Thank you, you know, thank, you, uh, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us tonight and, and shedding some light as to the situation on the ground in Labuan. We really appreciate your insights. We're going to take a quick break on the show and uh, continue this discussion about Labuan's development in just a few minutes. Stay tuned to consider this.
Thank you so much for staying with Sherrod and I on Consider This. Let's continue our conversation about Labuan. Joining us on the show now, we have Tan Sri Simon Sipaun, the Chairman of the Institute of Development Studies in Sabah. Good evening. Thank you so much for joining us on the show, Tan Sri. Now, um, what are some of the realities about Labuan's geographic location and its financial resources that perhaps constrains its ability to achieve the grand economic development plans that have been touted for it in the past? Um, she, Sabahans feel that Labuan, of course, is part and parcel of Sabah. Then um, a decision was taken to the best of my recollection on the, <coughs> by by the then Chief Minister Tan Sri Harris at the time to surrender Labuan uh, to the federal government. And I think it was uh, gazetted as a, as a federal territory in April of 1984. Of course, at the time, my impression was that the federal government did not have any specific plan for Labuan. And I think that was expected. Now, Tan Sri Harris was the Chief Minister at the time. And uh, my impression was that his reasoning for surrendering Labuan to the federal government was essentially financial and economic. This are uh, his reasons. Um, that is the impression I got. Why? Because billions of ringgit were committed to several big projects in Labuan at the time, including the methanol, gas, Spons iron plants, shipyard, ship, shipyard uh, flower feed mill, and so on. Now, according to him, if Labuan could be taken over by the federal government, the state government will be relieved of huge financial burden. According to him, Labuan will still be geographically where it is. It will not be moved away from the, its existing position. And uh, Tanjri Harris also at the time expected the federal government to be in a much better uh, position to spearhead the development of Labuan. Uh, Tanjri, if I can interject, uh, we've just spoken to uh, the MP for Labuan, uh, Rosman yeah. Isli, and he says that uh, one, there was a kind of loss of momentum in developing the, uh, the federal territory of Labuan, that that uh, Labuan finds itself, as it, as it were, neither here nor there. Would you agree with that uh, statement? Well, I have not, uh, you know, uh, been to Labuan recently. Last I was there was about three months ago. And I did not see much uh, difference between what Labuan was. And this was about uh, 36 odd years ago and, and, uh, and what it is today. Um, so... I very hard for me to agree or disagree with what the young Burumat says about Labuan. And I think he knows better the situation there. He being he lived there and he's the MP there, so he, he I think he's in a better position to assess the real situation. But as far as I'm concerned, uh, not much has taken place since uh, it became federal territory. Well, the other thing, so you talked a little bit about the economic development of Labuan, the, the plans for it. And I'm wondering how much that has materialised, especially as, again, uh, re referring to our conversation with uh, the MP for Labuan, he said that despite many companies registering in Labuan, they, their offices are headquartered in KL. So has the jobs materialised in Labuan? Has that created an economic multiplier in Labuan? Um. Uh, apart from a few companies like uh, Asian Supply Base, I think is has a good is a good future, employing a lot of people. But for the rest, I don't believe that it has progressed as much as expected by the state government or by the people of Sabah. I mean, that is how I look at it. Mm. Tansri, thank you so much for speaking with us tonight. We really appreciate your time. Now, uh, we have joining us on the line Professor Dato Dr. Kasim Mansor. He's the Dean of Faculty of Business, Economics and Accountancy at University Malaysia, Sabah. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Now, I'm wondering, uh, how would you uh, characterize the growth of the development of Labuan since it was handed over by Sabah to become a federal territory? Okay, thank you very much for having me. Actually, okay, now, um, well, ever since Labuan has been 
um, under the federal territory in October 1990, of course there is um, a pro progress has been happening in Labuan in the past 20 years. But of course there are lots of pockets of, you know, still um, left out by the process of development in Labuan. And we know that Labuan is very resourceful island. And uh, this island is has a vast oil and gas resources. And uh, plus um, the, you know, with the International Business Palace Center, this is the home of international investment and banking activities. So I think Labuan has lots of economics to offer, not only to Malaysia, but to the region in the Niaga area, also to the uh, Asian or ASEAN, uh, if not uh, in the world, to the world. Because right, these are just potentialities, right? We're not talking about what actually has transpired. The criticism seems to be, despite all these highfalutin plans and, and the talk of, you know, uh, of uh, Labuan being a financial center, you know, on par with Singapore and Hong Kong and, and Beijing even, uh, that that's actually not worked out. What is the reality on the ground? Not the potential, but the reality. Okay, now, you know, Labuan... As I can see uh, from from academic aspect, uh, we are running with one leg actually. We are not running with two legs. If you want to push Labuan further, we need to have two legs. And furthermore, the wings of how to position Labuan, we need a big wings. Now we are just flying with a very small wing, like mass wing or something like that. We need Boeing. You know, big aircraft, you know, something like that. This can is I, just to... Can I ask you, what, what would you recommend to, to help spur that de economic development in Labuan? What is needed? Then, yes, we, we need, you know, a big budget. You know, of course, we want to uplift Labuan. We need big budget for Labuan. If we just only, you know, allocate certain small amount of budget, we, we will go nowhere. Because, you yes, know, cousin, do you like, think, oh, uh, we spoke to the MP for Labuan, and he says there's been a, la a loss of momentum and a lack of interest that over the last decade or so, there has been very little leadership from uh, the Federation, from uh, the Centre, from Putrajaya around Labuan's development. Would you agree? Well, we have to relax some regulation rules and procedures, you know. Um, we have to liberalize, liberalize a lot of, you know, rules and regulations imposed by the federal territory in, in uh, Putrajaya. Uh, we don't have direct connection, something like that, to, you know, this connectivity is not there to the world. Mm -hmm. Labuan is not well connected. We have to establish the connection, you know, uh, but to establish that, we have to re relax and liberalize some of the policies. Otherwise, the, the status of loved one is, you know, just like uh, 20 years ago, 20, 30 years ago. Thank you so much for speaking with us tonight. It's been wonderful to hear so many different voices and perspectives about what's happening in Labuan. We appreciate your time. Thank you for joining us on the show. That's all the time we have for you in this episode of Consider This. I'm Melissa Idris. And I'm Sherrod Kutten, signing off for the evening. Thank you so much for watching. Good night.